Hey guys, um, sorry about the uh, screw up on my end of not having the slides viewable while I lectured. Um, must have just hit the wrong button and I apologize. So here's another attempt uh, at your lesson for Wednesday, April 22nd. Um, first, um, powers explicitly given to the president by the Constitution. Um, there are obviously in, in Article 2 of the Constitution a select group of powers that are explicitly stated and given to the president. Um, and they tend to fall into one of four categories. They're either a national security power, a legislative power, an administrative power, or a judicial power. Um, and you can see those here on this screen. Um, however, those are not the only powers that the president has, obviously. Uh, and, and really, the power of the president has changed and shifted dramatically uh, over time. Um, over the course of American history, we've seen presidential power get expanded uh, on a handful of different occasions. Um, the first of which, uh, picture down there in the bottom left, Thomas Jefferson in a, a um, Democratic-Republican flag, probably being the best example of that. Um, it's the first example that we have of, a, of the president of the United States being the president and also being the leader of a political party. Um, George Washington really was, was a pretty big at our, uh, opponent of partisan politics, uh, and John Adams just didn't have to deal with it all that much, um, taking over after after Washington. But with the uh, election inauguration and, and presidency of Thomas Jefferson as our third president, that's the first time that we see the president serve as the uh, president of the United States and the leader of a major political party at the same time. Um, for reference, yes, uh, if you're talking about who is the current leader of the Republican Party, uh, the obvious and correct answer would be President Trump. Um, the second expansion of presidential power, the second example of it, uh, is, is pictured there on the top right, and that's Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson addressing people, right? And really, the reason that this is an expansion of presidential power is because for the first time, um, Jackson, as president, views himself as a president for all American citizens. Um, through the first six U.S. presidents uh, before Jackson, uh, really they did not view themselves as the leader of all Americans. They viewed themselves as kind of just the head of the federal government. Uh, they thought that the leader of – they kind of viewed that idea of, of a connection to the people as something that belonged um, a little bit more to governors, uh, belonged a little bit more to legislators, um, and had a little and, – and did not necessarily include them quite so much. Uh, but Jackson is very much a, a man of the people, uh, and he views the presidency – as a direct, as a direct connector um, to all American citizens. Um, the third example that I would use uh, is President Lincoln up here in the top left. Uh, President Lincoln it, it expands presidential power a little bit in that, yes, he's always the president has always been the commander in chief of the army, um, but we've really to that point uh, up until the Civil War never really had the president also act as the commander in chief of the army, but also as the kind of the leader of a wartime people uh, and, and assisting in the mobilization of both the army uh, and the means of production uh, to make sure that the army is properly outfitted during the civil war. Uh, so really it has so much more to do with um, the president and his, his capacity or his um, role to serve as not only commander in chief of the military, but also as the person that is uh, kind of m moderating or, or regulating uh, what businesses are producing uh, in, in, in an effort to help the military. Um, the next example that I would use uh, is really one of two people. Uh, you can see President Wilson there picture in, in the picture on the bottom in the middle. He's on the right-hand side here. And then President Roosevelt, FDR, there sitting in the middle uh, on the, the picture in the bottom right. Um, obviously, Wilson, that's a picture from the end of end of World War One. And the Roosevelt picture there in the, in, in the bottom right is a picture from during World War Two. Uh, and really, the biggest piece of this is that uh, they are both they are both really the first major examples we have uh, of U.S. presidents serving as al also serving as world leaders. Right. That they are driving the conversation internationally um, more so than or more than just here at home. Right. Wilson's Wilson's big, um, big push or as, as a world leader um, was for the creation of the League of Nations, the predecessor to the, to the United Nations. And then ultimately um, FDR's uh, relationship with Churchill, with Stalin um, during World War Two really is the backbone uh, of the strength of the Allied forces during World War Two uh, and ultimately leads to a um, 
a peace conference after World War II uh, that is driven by the United States. So uh, Wilson and FDR um, are really our first examples of U.S. presidents acting as international leaders. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about today is presidential strength. Uh, so every four or five years, um, C-SPAN and other historical organizations get together uh, and they do a presidential historian survey. And they ask historians, uh, presidential historians, they ask researchers, they ask all sorts of people um, to essentially rank the presidents. Who, who were the strongest? Who were the best? Right. And in and, and 2017 was the most recent um, poll or survey that they did. And the top 10 is listed there on the left. Abe Lincoln being at the top of the list. The bottom 10 there on the right-hand side of the screen, James Buchanan uh, finishing in dead last. And, and what I find interesting when looking at this chart is we talked about informal qualifications yesterday, and we talked about formal qualifications yesterday. And, and really, what I think you come to realize when you when you look at the people that, that are on, in the top 10 of this list is it has so much less to do with who they were as people and everything to do with who, what they dealt with as president of the United States. Were they the president during some sort of major event? And if the answer to that question is yes, do most people generally think that they handled it well? Right. If you go down the list, every one of them had some sort of major event either in their life or during their presidency uh, that they had to react to. Right? You go down the list and it's Lincoln, Civil War, George Washington, Revolutionary War, FDR, Great Depression and World War II, Teddy Roosevelt, probably probably the biggest personality that we've ever had as president, also uh, a Spanish-American war hero uh, and really a, a big proponent of American imperialism. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Dwight D. Eisenhower, World War II hero, Harry S. Truman, end of World War II, Thomas Jefferson, largely connected to um, the uh, crafting of the Declaration of Independence and Revolutionary America, John Kennedy, um, Cold War, Ronald Reagan, Cold War, Lyndon Johnson, Cold War, and Vietnam, right? So all of them had major, major, major events. Um, sometimes the, they, they handled them well, sometimes they didn't handle them well, but they were the people, they were the people, the person sitting in that chair. They were the president uh, at a time of national, um, I don't want to say crisis, but national peril. Something was potential, had potentially gone bad and they were the person at the controls. Uh, and as such, they're, rem they're remembered very well as a result. It has so much less to do with their personality, so much less to do with their with their politics, um, and really everything to do with the fact that they were the person in the position uh, when, so when, when America needed to respond. If you look at the people on the other end of that, on the other end of that list, uh, the bottom, the people in the bottom 10, there aren't a ton of super significant events during any of these presidencies. Uh, obviously, the only exclusions to that would be uh, Herbert Hoover at the very start of the Great Depression, uh, and then Andrew Johnson, who's responsible for Reconstruction after after the Civil War. Uh, but other than that, they they just don't have any significant events that they needed to react to, major, major, major historical events that they needed to react to, that they needed to respond to. Um, it's really it's really crazy to think that William Henry Harrison finishes as the sixth worst president of all time in this survey when the man was was really not in office for very long because he died shortly into his term after getting pneumonia uh, on inauguration day. So uh, it's not necessarily a criti criticism of them as people. Uh, really, what we talk about or what we look at when we talk about presidential strength has so much more to do with um the circumstances, the events, and that that they that took place to the to the people in in the White House, um, in the Oval Office, and how they responded to it. So, keeping that in mind, uh, there's a Google form posted in Google Classroom. Please respond to the question in that Google form. It is a little bit of an opinion question, so you can kind of take it a million different ways. Uh, the only reason it's been put up there. Um, is because I kind of just want to make sure that people are staying on, on track, everybody's staying on board, uh, and it's an opportunity to get some cheap and easy points as well. So uh, other than that, have a great day. I'm sorry for the mistake on the first recording. Uh, I, just, I just botched it. So um, hopefully this is a little bit better for you. Other than that, have a great day, and I'll talk to you guys tomorrow.